joining us for this discussion of The Lady Eve, uh, one of many wonderful films that Preston Sturgis produced in the 1940s. And I say produced in the non-filmic sense, he wrote and directed them um, and probably wasn't allowed to be a producer because it was a studio system. But in any case, um, we're glad you're here with us to discuss this movie and also here with us to discuss this movie is the person who uh, selected it and introduced it so ably in uh, last week's video, uh, Lisa DeKnight. So uh, thanks for joining us, Lisa. My pleasure. And we uh, have a uh, few rules for Zoom that most of you I'm sure are familiar with. Please keep yourself muted unless you are talking, uh, making your comment or asking your question and you will know to do that because I will call on you. And how will I know to call on you? And the answer is you will please use your hand raise function within Zoom and that way I will know to call on you and you can then please ask your question or make your comment and um, then please mute yourself and, and so the discussion can proceed from there. And uh, we also have, uh, you have the ability to use the chat function. My colleague Jill is monitoring that. So you can introduce yourself to us. You can introduce yourself to the other uh, people in the discussion. Uh, and if you're from outside the uh, sort of greater Philadelphia area, please let us know where you're from in the chat. We would, you know, we've gotten some attendees from around the country and even around the world, and we'd love to know who's with us. Uh, and uh, with that being said, um, I think we can begin our discussion of the Lady Eve with uh, our first question or comment uh, coming from David. Good evening and, and thank you. I, I You may have noticed I sort of like to lead off some of the things to get people interested and started. Uh, I'd like you and Lisa to comment a little bit about the music. I, I thought that it was subtle, but very, very appropriate whenever I noticed it. Um, we've talked about some of the music in the past that some of it's very obvious, some of it we've, we've critiqued, uh, but I thought this was very subtle. Um, and I wanted the, the two of you to, to comment on that. And, and also on the range of acting of the two leads, they both seem to be able to do the, uh, the, the acting part, uh, carrying their characters, and then especially uh, Fonda with those pratfalls and all of that, that silly stuff. He did that just as well as he did the, the, the more attempts at serious comedy. Um, uh, comments and thank you both for it and, and at least a thanks for the uh, selection. Well, um, I have thoughts on both of those matters, but uh, Lisa, why don't you uh, start us off on the, the music question and the sort of, you know, performance uh, assessment comment? Sure. Um, the, the music, uh, it's, it's interesting that you say it, it is subtle because it, I, I sometimes don't remember the music as well in this film, but it is very appropriate. Uh, there are certain themes that kind of stick in your head now that I'm replaying them in my mind. Uh, and I, I know that the score kind of wove in a, a couple different um, popular tunes of the day. I don't remember the, the names of them exactly, but um, it, it was not uh, a usual occurrence for that at that time. Um, maybe Andrew has some more information on that, but um, yeah, the, the score, great score, but low key, understated. Um, doesn't do any shouting above the crazy acting, which uh, to lead into your your other comment, yes, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. They both play their you know sophistication and their total pratfall fall into a, a you know bowl of dip <laughs> so well. Um, Henry Fonda and Barbara Stanwyck both had done comedic performances. Um, in fact, one even together uh, a couple years before this came out. So it it was something that they'd already you know tried tried their uh, their um, acting skills, act, acting chops in before. But this is really the the pinnacle of both of them being able to fall so well and also uh, comport themselves with elegance and style. 
I'm glad uh, you made that uh, comment about the motifs sort of of, of more popular melodies or well-known melodies um, being woven through the score because I, I'm pretty sure I heard Isn't It Romantic um, playing through the music and if it wasn't that it was another song of that of that vintage and of that ilk um, and that is something that that was not common at the time it certainly didn't you know produce a soundtrack with 10 or 12 well-placed pop hits for most movies uh in 1940 uh or 41 and that uh but the incorporation of of popular motifs far more so than classical which was pretty common was rare i think there are two other things to chalk up the unintrusive score to i think one is genre uh, though there were moments where this movie had some dramatic tension and certainly sexual tension and some more serious moments, um, it is at its heart a screwball comedy. And, and we can talk a little bit more about what that means specifically, though you did a nice job in your introduction of, of outlining it. But you typically don't find sort of overwhelming soundtracks in screwball comedies, in part because the 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 employment, music itself, and then the employment of music uh, as a score to a film, those are both heavily reliant on timing. But what else is heavily reliant on timing? Comedy, whether it's physical or verbal. And so having to sort of interweave the score, it sort of, you know, gets sort of kicked down the, the list of priorities there when, when other timing is more important. Um, the other thing I would say is like a lot of uh, com uh, screwball comedies, but particularly the films of a, of a very smart uh, and sharp writer-director like Preston Sturgis, there's a lot of, you know, sort of almost under the breath lines of dialogue and, and sort of rejoinders and things like that, and none of which any of us should want to miss, but certainly Sturgis didn't want us to miss them, and an intrusive score would have, um, you know, would have made that more likely to happen as well, I think. Uh, regarding the performances, um, I mean, Henry Fonda had done comedy before, but I mean, he his towering performances to this point were young Mr. Lincoln and Tom Joad in The Grapes of Wrath. And uh, this was an enormous departure in many ways from them. Um, and for Barbara Stanwyck, I mean, she was known as Stella Dallas and, and Babyface. And you see shades of that in, particularly when she has the sharper elbows as Jean, but um, you know, a, a good actor is supposed to really be able to do, you know, anything. And, and these two proved that they could. Um, and the film's obviously all the more better for it. Let's see, uh, Joss, you had a question or comment. Uh, yes. Um, well, I, I've heard of this film, but I've never seen it before. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I agree with David and, and your comments about the performances. I mean, it was just a revelation to see Henry Fonda um, doing this, the pratfalls and, and, and slapstick stuff. I mean, his performance was otherwise so quiet and understated and shy. Um, but as good as he was, Barbara Stanwyck, it seemed to me, just owned this film. I mean, she just drove the whole thing. And it's something that Lisa had mentioned in her introduction. Um, and I, was, I had never seen it before. I'd never seen her really, I don't think, in anything other than Double Indemnity, which in some ways is related in her, in her manipulation, but the tone of it is just so shockingly different. Um, so I had two questions. One is a short question. The use of animals as a, as, a, as a motif in screwball comedies, and I'm thinking in terms of um, bringing up baby and this film. And then something else Lisa had mentioned in her introduction was how the screwball comedies set up the character of the femme fatale. And I wonder if she can elaborate on that a little bit because it really works with Barbara Stanwyck in this film and Double Indemnity. Thank you. Thanks, Joss. Uh, Lisa, uh, please choose whichever one you'd like to tackle first. Um, well, I, I guess I'll tackle the, the animals first because that came first. Um, I 
love the uh, the snake uh, motif metaphor in the Lady Even, and you're right that there are so many other uh, animal motifs throughout screwball comedy, but but this one in particular is so multivalent, like that there are so many different um, things that you can tease out of the snake metaphor. Uh, and I, I mean, I guess that there's sort of a, a central, um, the film is telling you snakes equal X in a way, but inviting you to, to look at a, a couple of different options. Um, and I'll just point to what the film is saying, snakes equal X. Um, in the, the uh, scene where Henry Fonda's character is in the dining room on the ship and reading a book. <laughs> the book says, are snakes necessary? And that is a direct allusion to a, a pretty famous book from the time, Is Sex Necessary? So it's, it's a pretty direct correlation. You know, the, the snake is a phallic symbol, but the snake is also Barbara Stanwyck and her, her father's, you know, they're, they're carn sharks, they're snakes. So that there's so many different little um, plays on the snake motif, and I'm sure we'll get into even more of them as the conversation continues. But uh, th those are some of my comments on the uh, the animal motif in the Lady Eve. Um, and then to to touch on the the interesting transition um, that I, I brought up from the the female in screwball comedy to the female and the total and in film noir it's 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 so interesting that that right around the time that the lady eve came out in 1941 um was when america was entering world war ii i guess the very end of 1941 and and scholars typically um place the the end of screwball comedy as a genre at around 1942. So this is really late in the game and you can see a little inferences to the war and the, and the Lady Eve, you know, the, the ships have stopped running, uh, things like that. And it, it's just such a, a pivotal moment, this 1941, 1942 era, because that's when film noirs started to come out. I guess the Maltese Falcon was 1941. Um, and so I, I just, find it really interesting to to trace that female character um, from this this one genre to the other that kind of not supplants it directly but you can just almost see the them uh, exchanging places uh in in that 1941-1942 time period and it's it's just such a a, a ripe area to to muse on because you know female empowerment in screwball comedy, well, you know, you, you still had to end up married at the end or something like that. Um, there, there was such a, 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 a rich vein for, for female characters to be independent and liberated and, and have careers, enjoy sex. Like th there's just so much um, independence in a female character in screwball comedy. And there's independence in a femme fatale character as well. And a lot of those same characteristics remain, but the, the, the kind of dramatic emphasis on female empowerment is couched in much more hostility, I, I would say, in film, film noir. And I'm sure a lot of that has to do with the, the male-female uh, divide men going off to fight females staying at home there's so much you can really read into that but it's a fascinating thing to kind of chew on a little bit that very almost clean uh transition i mean the, th the thing that those two genres have in common that you don't see in any other genre at the time not even the melodrama which is the other genre where you have women sometimes being uh, assertive, although um, it's never for anything related to sexuality or romance in the melodrama because it's about be mother and family and motherhood. Um, that's the big thing these two genres have in common is you see sexually a sexually aggressive female character in film noir, obviously, and you do see such characters from time to time in screwball comedies. 
this film has one of the biggest examples of that. I mean, she is, film historians and people at the time were surprised at how aggressive she was allowed to be by the industry um, and in Sturgis's depiction of her. But you see sexual, sexually assertive women in other, um, uh, in other entries in this genre. One of my favorite films from 1937, The Awful Truth, um, it's very clear, particularly toward the end of the film, that Irene Dunn isn't just interested in being married to Cary Grant, she is interested in being in bed with Cary Grant's character. And, um, you know, to varying degrees, you see that sort of, um, you see that there's a sexual component to the woman's, the female character, you know, going after these men, which, which, was, which was relatively uncommon. So I think that's a very, uh, a very clear lineage between the two genres. Um, I think regarding animals, this movie has, a, you know, there are a lot of animals in screwball comedies that bring up baby, um, and again, in The Awful Truth, and um, also I think uh, other comedies, you have um, the dog Asta, who sort of is a surrogate child. It's, you know, if you're going to fight over custody of a dog, that's something you can treat more lightly than fighting over custody of an actual human child which would not have been allowed to occur in a comedy um, at that time, certainly. Uh, here, uh, for all the, all the insightful comments Lisa made, the animal has far more symbolic importance than it does in these other films, but it also there's also an extent to which, here in a much smaller level, I think, than in something like Bringing a Baby, it functions in a way as a MacGuffin, which is, you know, it gives, um, uh, in this movie, it gives Oliver Stanwyck at least um, a, a fig leaf of an excuse to run so hysterically, hysterically from Henry Fonda's room down to her own, and to for her to claim that she needs to be held while she's holding him in, in that very memorable, um, romantic and you know erotic scene. Uh, and same with bringing up baby. That baby provides a lot of opportunity for Cary Grant and uh, Catherine Hepburn to have their back and forth and have to keep being together and so on and so forth. So there's that core element. But here, because it's Sturgis and because he has a sort of acid tongue when it comes to quote unquote battles of the sexes and stuff, um, there's much more symbolic depth to it as well as um, clever use uh, in structuring the plot. Let's see, uh, Liz, you have a question or comment. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I um, am aware that um, um, that Preston Sturgis originally told Barbara Stanwyck that he'd write and direct a comedy for her when she was in Remember the Night, which he wrote. And um, and so this was the comedy. But I as she had told him that she was usually, she had done some crime dramas and she told him that she, she was usually um, carrying a gun in a film and she wouldn't know how she'd do exactly with comedy. And I thought this was interesting because in effect, um, she's like killing him softly, you know, with embarrassment, you know? It, it's like, um, I wonder if, if Sturgis had had that in mind. Um, I, I don't know for a fact one way or the other, but I, I do think that um, it tends to be a function of this genre that the characters put each other through their paces and at least as often as not, it's the woman putting the male character through his paces. Um, and uh, I mean, you see in the movies, other screwball comedies I've mentioned, you see the female characters, you know, doing things, doing things, you know, per, in, in such a way with such purpose, either pretending to be bad at them, pretending to things to go wrong, things like that, because they're trying to sort of move the man to where the, the position they want him to be in, typically a position of either vulnerability um, or in a position where even the densest man will eventually realize that he loves the woman who's trying to get him to realize that he loves her. So, um, you know, I, I do think though that uh, you know, there is what starts out, I think, you know, actually it's not true. I was going to say that she has a sort of vindictiveness to her and, a, and a, an aggressive hostility to her 
when she first decides to become the Lady Eve. But you know what? You see that in other movies too. I mean, uh, Irene Dunn in The Awful Truth takes up with Ralph Bellamy to try and make Cary Grant jealous. Now, I don't know if that who that was harder on, Cary Grant or Irene Dunn, but she was trying to, to spite him clearly. So, um, you know, I, I think that I, I think that the fact that that Stanwyck Stanwyck's character is a is a grifter and comes from a family of grifters, um, I, I think that probably couldn't help but be inspired by some of those roles she had played. But um, it's also something that Sturgis would have a lot of fun with as well. Uh, Lisa, you you covered it pretty well, but uh, I I love the uh, the line when. Um, Barbara Stanwyck is at the the racing park, and she you know devises this this phantom uh, persona to exact her revenge. Her her line is, "I need him like the axe needs the turkey." So so there's something you know, it's a joke, but it's it's murderous there. So yeah, I I, I appreciate that. I uh, thought she she's so sharp, like her her even her body. She's all angles and sharp edges and. She just naturally carries with her this uh, cutting vibe. So yes, it, it works very well in, uh, in, in gangster mall roles, but it also works very well in comedy. And that they even, I mean, she had to change her appearance nominally at least to, to transform into Eve, but her hair is up or much more closely cropped. So it, the, it removes the sort of soft locks and curls so that makes her a little sharper when she's out for revenge and she's often wearing a hat you know that sort of seems like it's going to slice if he gets too close so they they were thoughtful in in changing her uh, character's appearance as well at least nominally uh dana you have a question or comment hi uh, i love preston sturgis i never met a preston sturgis movie i didn't love um the thing about this movie that I think I want to hug the most is, and Lisa, you mentioned it, of course, in your introduction, the marvelous, marvelous uh, background people. They aren't background at all. The wonderful Charles Coburn and William Demarest and Eugene Collette. I mean, it's it, we got to talk about, you know, uh, Barbara Stanwyck and Henry Fonda, but this movie is so rich because of these terrific character people. And one of the things that I noticed about them is they kind of create the sense, at least for me, of Americana. I mean, they're sort of Damon Runyon-esque people. They're types, they're real American types. They're funny American types. Um, they're, they're no no holes barred, they don't pull any punches. And they're just, every time you see them, they're consistently fun and funny. I mean, Muggsy Murgatroyd, the, the name alone is just, Fantastic. I, I just so talk a little bit about the back, the the the, the character actors. They, I just love them all. Uh, Lisa, would you like to take this first? Mm, yes, I I love them all so much. I want to give each and every one of them a hug, but especially Eric Bloor. He's my favorite. My my heart is with Eric Bloor, and you you can tell he, he is Sir Alfred McGlennon Keith in the film, if you don't know uh, the name Eric Bloor. Um, he, it, Preston Sergis, you can just, you can tell that he loves every single one of these people so much because, it, and I, I, you know, have my, my heart set on Eric Bloor, but he, he writes for them. Like, it, you know, in, in a, a normal film, the leads would get all the best lines most of the best lines go to, if not Barbara Stanwyck, one of the, the supporting characters. And, and I feel like Preston Sergis, um, like especially wrote for Eric Bohr and trying to like play up his, his lisp. I'm pretty sure when he's talking to Henry Fonda, like out of 60 words, 59 started with S. Like he just, he loves these people and, and we love them. The, the faces are also interesting and, and the, the eclecticism of the language, I think um, something you were pointing to Dana uh, is, is just such an endless treat. Every single Preston Sturgis film you, you see, you have this, this sheer like panorama of of linguistic delight. Um, it, it is very Americana, but you have, you know, continental European, 
um, you know, archaic, florid speech paired with, you know, some gutter snipe goofiness from, from William Demarest. Like, it's, it's just such a, a, a pleasure for the ears to, to listen to the, the language spoken by not just the leads, but all of the, uh, the background players too. And it, it's very democratic too. I feel like in, in any given Preston Sturgis movie, uh, you know, a, a butler or a, a chauffeur is just as likely to have some wonderful monologue uh, as a, a lead. So yes, he, he, he loves his background players. There's actually a, a great page on Wikipedia that um, has a, a little breakdown chart of which actors were in which Preston Sturgis films. And in some, yeah, I think William Demers was maybe in 10 of his films, if you include ones that Preston Sturgis was a, a writer on before he directed. So yeah, love the, love the background players. Yes, yeah, Sturgis worked with a lot of these people many times. Um, a lot of them are in a lot of his films. Um, some of them are in other films of the genre of the era as well. And I think that um, along the lines of what Dana was saying that, and I guess this is why Lisa sort of moved into talking about the dialogue is, it's not just that he has an ear for what is good dialogue. He has an ear for what the, what would be the right dialogue for that character, that sort of person to say. And the fact that he is interested in different types of Americans, I mean, you, you see that across his movies and there are, there are the sort of, you know, rich, you know, thoroughly upper crust types. Then there are the new money types like we saw with, uh, you know, uh, Charles's Hopsy's dad um, and and there's everything in between this is one of the big reasons this sort of you know this not just this fondness for but this ability to present and communicate so efficiently the sense of Americana is one of the reasons one of the reasons there are a number but it's one of the reasons why a lot of people think that the Coen brothers are Sturgis's heir apparent they're huge fans of his work as I'm sure many of you know but if you watch their films, you see, one, you see a lot of colorful supporting and background characters, um, but two, you see an effort to really give a strong sense of a particularly American time or particularly American place. Um, and it's not done um, in a way to, to make fun of the people. It's really done as a way to sort of present them as elements of the tapestry that is their view of of America. And I think Sturgis has that same sort of affection for it. And you actually see some of that affection to different British types in some Alfred Hitchcock films too, particularly his earlier ones. Let's see, uh, Kenneth, you have a question or comment. Um, hi, um, there were uh, a couple of funny scenes I was gonna mention that I'm not sure if they had to do with the main plot. Uh, but one was the uh, when Henry Fonda's father was first introduced and he sang that song in that deep baritone voice. It, it kind of gave a clue. I, I was, I guess, trying to explain what kind of character he was, but it kind of made me like him right away. And then the way he sat at the table and started banging at the pots and pans so someone would serve him breakfast. Uh, I just thought it was an interesting introduction to him. Uh, and the other scene, which someone just mentioned in the chat, was the, the one with the horse, where they were trying to take the picture and the horse kept sticking his head in. Uh, I, I couldn't stop laughing. I'm not sure if there was some symbolism to that, but I, I thought I was watching the funniest home videos show. It was just, uh, it was so well done. And, and Henry Fonda never got upset, never swatted him away, just kept pushing him. Um, and something more germane to the plot that um, I couldn't decide when Barbara Stanwyck, like everybody else, became interested in Henry Fonda on the ship. Was she trying to um, seduce him or was she just trying to control him so she could toy with him? Because I think she wanted to, uh, she hadn't given up on the idea of conning him a little bit too with her father. She did stand up for him, but you got the feeling that uh, eventually she was going uh, to, to try to play games with him too. And I just couldn't, I, it was hard for me to understand just what her intentions were for him. Um, All right, well, th thanks, Ken. Um, I think that uh, uh, my sense was that initially she was going about it um, to con him and that's what, that's what they were on that ship for and that's, what, that's how she saw him. 
Um, but I think over the course of that, uh, she developed genuine feelings for him. But uh, Lisa, do you have a different view of it? That is exactly my view. And, and there's, you know, there's so much emphasis when you talk about Preston Sturgis on the dialogue. I mean, he, he himself would say that, you know, dialogue is the best insurance you have to ensure your movie's success. Um, but I, I don't think he, he gets enough credit for his camera work or, or where he places the camera, what the camera's doing, because the, the scene where Barbara Stanwyck is talking to her father and uh, their, their friend, um, fellow con artist, uh, where, where she's admitting to them that she does have feelings for this man and she's almost admitting it to herself in that exact moment. Um, she, she's framed by the two men in the doorway and they're kind of talking amongst themselves and the, the camera just kind of slowly zooms in on, on Barbara Stanwyck's face and she's, you know, for a minute not really paying attention to them. She's just kind of looking into, you know, into the distance, uh, lost in her own thoughts for a minute. And you, you really do get the sense, and maybe someone would disagree with me, but you, you really do get the sense that she, she is falling for this, you know, strange backward guy uh, that she, yes, absolutely was just trying to con initially. Um, and they, they just, they have such a great chemistry together and, and they, they have scenes together where you, you just believe in it. And I, I find it so extraordinary anytime I see a Preston Sturgis movie, how economical he is with getting us to believe in, in what he's trying to get across. Like I, I think maybe that's, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 minutes max into the movie, if that, and we just believe it. Like we believe that she was trying to con him and now she, she's falling in love with him. And that, that lit, and I, I just want to kind of point out again that that little tiny zoom into her face framed by the two men, it just seals, seals the deal. Even if we don't really notice what's going on with the camera, it just makes us subconsciously or consciously know that she is falling for him. I, I think you said a couple of really interesting things there. One, you talked about his efficiency in that characterization, I think that that's part of the, um, you know, explanation behind the introduction of uh, Henry Fonda's father um, of the uh, uh, the older Pike. Um, it's important for the film, and it's important for Sturgis to let us know um, for the characters that this that the apple fell very very far from that tree. And he does it in part by casting and in part by the performance of the actor who is singing out of mirth, I guess, which you never see Henry Fonda's character sort of say anything unnecessary, make a peep that is, you know, is not explicitly called for. You certainly don't see him doing something jovial like singing. Um, and then you don't see him, if, if he were, if he received a phone call about a party at his house that he didn't know about, he would have been mortified. He wouldn't have, you know, hey, thanks for telling me. Great, what time's our party that we're having? You know, so, I mean, that's very efficiently in that, I mean, what is that, a minute, minute and a half? He, he really draws um, a rich uh, and in an informative portrait of that character for moving forward. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think as a very, very smart, uh, storyteller, um, he is always thinking about what can he, you know, all, I say this all the time, like both, like smart filmmakers are trying to ac accomplish multiple things in a given scene. And he need, we need to know that there's a party that night, that, that the, the opportunity for her to meet him that she was talking about with her, you know, uncle um, has come to pass. But we also need to meet this guy who's going to have a, you know, a, a an important part of the film moving forward. And we need to understand what he's about so we don't have to wonder how he'll react to things as the film starts hurtling towards its conclusion. So it's it's very, very smart 
uh, filmmaking, I think, in that regard. And, and that's, you know, something Sturgis is, is rightly appreciated for. Um, I also thought, you know, Lisa, the thing you said, you know, you're absolutely right. When Typically when a filmmaker, a director is also a writer, the focus tends to be on, on his or her words. And, you know, I, I guess that's understandable, but um, there is there are examples of thoughtful composition and thoughtful camera work, and you identified one. Another one I thought of was, um, and this is where I thought you were going, was when we meet everybody in the dining room of the ship, and Barbara Stanwyck's got her compact mirror, and it's sort of framed like a movie screen, and she's sort of narrate. It's either a movie screen or a sporting event on television, and she's doing the play by play. But either way, you know. That's a very sort of, you know, visually interesting and smart way to let us know that this isn't going to be like, you know, this is a movie about men and women and how they interact and, you know, you know, the, the wiles of women and the foibles of men and all that stuff, but it's not going to be like the others you've seen. Because in those other movies, any one of those methods those other women used would have worked. Um, and would have been what the main heroine would have used, but not in this movie. Um, she's going to outright trip him and crack her shoe heel off in the process to get the ball rolling in the most bold and dramatic fashion. And frankly, you know, really probably far more aggressive than someone dropping their handkerchief. So that's another instance where it's thoughtful composition and, and use of filmmaking technique, I thought. Um, Lillian, you have a question or comment. Yeah, to, just to go back to the Barbara Stanwyck character, uh, when when she decides about this little game she's going to play to exact her revenge, um, I, I was thinking about how muddled and angry she must have felt because not only did she not set up this con, which was the whole point of trying to meet Henry Fonda on the ship, uh, she allowed herself to fall for him, and then he rejected her. And I was thinking about what Lisa said about the uh, axe and the turkey, because after they get married and they get on the train and she starts telling him the stories that she tells him, it's almost like she kept sticking a knife into him until he got off the train and slid into the mud. Yeah. Um, I, you're exactly right. I mean, th think about what we know about that character for him to get off a train in the middle of the night away from a stop in his pajamas. I mean, he had to have been just, just horrified um, and deeply wounded by what he was, what he was hearing. Um, Lisa, your thoughts. Um this this idea of identity that I, I talked about, it, it's so fascinating and we could talk forever about it, but um, this creation of Eve, this this character to exact revenge on him because she, she is angry, even though he sort of rightfully called her out, he did not forgive in that moment. Um, she, as Muggsy would say, she is positively the same dame but she's also she's also not like Eve is is an altered version of Jean because she is altered by this this anger and this this need to to belittle him and, and make him feel just as bad as she felt in that moment when she was summarily dumped um, and again to to point to just a, a lovely camera shot once she has you know, completed her revenge, uh, you know, w woven stories of Hubert and Herbert and, and all, all of her, you know, promiscuous past. Um, and she sees uh, Charles, you know, take off and fall into the mud. She, she you, you see her from behind and she's lowering the, the train curtain in just such a way that you know immediately through her performance and through the camera work that she is ashamed of what she has done or maybe not ashamed, but she, she, she does not like what she has done and what it has given her. It's given her the revenge she thought she wanted, but that camera movement alone and that performance of just sh shutting a curtain speaks volumes as to her 
initial motivations being something that has, you know, be careful what you wish for essentially. Um, and, and kind of closing the door on that Lady Eve character in such a way that, you know, she goes through this transformation. She, she doesn't want his money at the end. She just wants to try to make it work with him. Um, so yes, I, I, I probably talked a lot in circles, but that's, uh, that's my thoughts on that. Well, it's, you know, it's easy to, you know, it's easy to forget the extent to which she is vulnerable um, in the, you know, when he initially breaks up with her uh, on the ship that first time, right? We think of him, and understandably, we think of him as the fragile one um, because of his sheltered lifestyle and his sort of meek manner and his, uh, what seems to me to be clear inexperience with both women and the ways of the world, probably because he's been so sheltered in some way uh, by his wealth. Um, but think about what she's done, right? You know, we think of him as the potential victim because he's the mark of these, you know, seasoned grifters. And that's true. But she has broken her cardinal rule of actually developing genuine feelings for a mark, something that she's probably never done before. And she has sort of, you know, spurned her father um, to an extent to do that. And she's actively sort of thwarted her father's efforts to, you know, recoup some of his investments, so to speak, which, you know, it's, it, you know, I don't think it's, she has earth shat shattering sorrow about it, but she really put herself out there. She really put herself out there and she was determined to do the right thing. And she was trying to do the right thing. And the one time she tries to do the right thing, this guy, you know, it it's, has the worst possible ending. And he doesn't give her any credit for her, tr you know, doing the things she had done to thwart her father and for trying to do right by him. Now, I'm not saying he should have because in part because he didn't know, but you can imagine her upset, not just at being jilted as a, as a lover and the, he's no longer interested in her in that regard, supposedly, but also the one time she really puts herself out there sort of in terms of her family and her, her morality and all those sorts of things. And she just has, you know, she gets shut down. That, you know, she, I, I understand why she was as angry as she was, but as Lisa said, she pulls off her her revenge plot and realizes that it's it's cold comfort, if any. Let's see, uh, Barbara, you have a question or comment. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Roseanne, did you have a question or comment? Yes, I do, actually. I wanted to go back to the um, uh, horse scene. Um, on, on a lighter uh, uh, topic. So when I watched the horse scene, you know, Kenneth talked about it and it was in the chat. So when I watched it, it made me laugh out loud. And I was wondering, but it, what it looked like um, as a viewer was that it was really an outtake and that the horse, you know, wasn't cooperating. But it was so funny, they thought, well, let's just include it because it's just so damn funny. Do you have any information or thoughts on that? Because it was funny. Uh, thanks for that, Roseanne. Uh, Lisa. Oh, it was totally, totally calculated. It, I don't know what exactly they put on the back of Henry Fonda's jacket, maybe like some peanut paste but it was absolutely supposed to be, <laughs> be on purpose. And I, I agree, I cannot watch that scene without laughing out loud every time. It is so hilarious that the, the horse is like ro rolling eyes in the background, it's wonderful. Um, but I, I love that it is filmed in a way that at first you are not sure if it is just, you know, an outtake, like the horse is being unruly, uh, but, when the, the camera shifts from, you know, straight on looking at Barbara Stanwyck and Henry Fonda and the horse in the background, the camera shifts so that you see the horse continuing to, to get in there and Henry Fonda pushing him away and again and again. And as an aside, you can absolutely see Henry Fonda uh, trying not to crack up. <laughs> like when he turns to shoo the horse away, that the 
sides of his mouth is just quivering. It's wonderful. Um, but I, I, I love that scene because Charles is reciting the same flowery dialogue that he had on the bow of the ship to Jean. He's reciting that to Eve. And so th this opens up, you know, a, a whole host of questions. It's just a canned line <laughs> that he gives about, you know, knowing her when she was, when they were children and going way, way back, maybe all the way back to Adam and Eve. Like you, you definitely get the sense that there's a reason why he's almost exactly repeating the same words. And then of course, because Eve, you know, Jean has heard this before, she's like, oh yeah, and a Glenn, like she, she is filling in the blanks. And the, the horse's insertion in that scene just works to undercut the sincerity and the ridiculousness of it all the more. Um, and it, it's, it's fascinating scene. I mean, you, every single scene in this movie, even ones that are just humorous, almost you would think for the sake of being humorous, has such a, a depth to it when you start to poke at it a little bit more. Because, you know, Henry Fonda could just be reciting these lines because they're his favorite canned lines, or something in him, in his, in his body, in his soul, not his mind, knows that this is positively the same dame and he loves this woman despite her name and so he's just say oh yeah I, I have always known you I, I knew, knew you when we were kids and he's reciting the same line because whether or not he knows it intellectually he knows it emotionally that he loves this person um, or he could just be you know reciting his canned lines that have worked decently in the past it's a great great scene i i think that it's sort of like those of men who don't have to wear suits to work um we tend to have one suit in our closet and anytime a suit is called for that's the suit um i think that's henry fonda had so little <laughs> call for romantic lines that he had one, he memorized it, and he took it out every time he had to wear a suit. That's, that's what I think. Um, I didn't know for a fact that the scene was orchestrated, but I had no doubt the way you did, Lisa, but I had no doubt because Sturgis did not leave things to chance, particularly something that, um, that big. Uh, but the fact that it is one of the more subtle animal performances, um, I think, speaks to uh, Sturgis's ability as a director. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sure he didn't talk to the horse directly himself. But um, uh, it's very smart. The other thing, too, is the comedy to me. That's the brilliant part of it, because if you can think of think of what would bother the Henry Fonda character most at that moment, it is this sort of like uncontrollable, enormous, variable that keeps sort of stepping on his efforts to woo, which he's already not very good at. So um, yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a brilliant scene. He's trying to lead the romantic conversation there. And he is undercut not just by Eve slash Jean, he's also undercut by the horse. <laughs> like it's, it's perfect. Yeah. Uh, Barbara, are you there with your question or comment? Okay, then we'll go to Meredith. Meredith, your question or comment, please. Hi, um, I ha just had one um, comment and then a couple questions. Um, I think there's a really interesting subplot with Barbara Stanwyck and her father um, because her father has a vested interest in keeping her because she's bait, you know, for for these guys. So I, you know, he's an interest in things not working out for her. And I just think the whole issue of a transfer of a woman from her father to her husband, you know, is part of what's going on in like that first card playing scene. But like, I wanted to know if you could talk about the costumes a little bit about Barbara Stanwyck's costumes because they seem very carefully, you know, deliberately chosen. And then if you could just say anything about the line, a moonlit deck is a woman's business office because I really appreciated your point about the economy of the language. And I just think that line is like, just just very, very rich. Uh, well, well uh, thanks Meredith. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right um, about the sort of, you know, 
lowercase p political um, aspect of the, the sort of transfer of the quote unquote, you know, asset, if we go way back in history, we, we all know that there used to be dowries and why there were dowries and things like that. And, and it's a, uh, obviously um, a really problematic practice, but um, it is interesting that in this movie, which doesn't want us to dwell on things as serious as that, I don't think the, the movie kind of makes it clear that her dad isn't thrilled for his daughter to be getting married, which is not something you usually see in movies like this. Um, and certainly um, if it is, it's because the woman's marrying the wrong guy, um, like in It Happened One Night or something, but he's happy for her to go off and have her own life with a different guy in, in that movie. And here it's not about Charles. It's not that Henry Fonda is or isn't worthy. Um, you're right, Meredith. Uh, it's that it's that she's it's that she's leaving, and they're the, this good thing they have going is is going to come to an end. Um, Lisa, your thoughts on that, or any of the other comments Meredith brought up? Yeah, um, the the father character, Colonel Harrington, um, is is so interesting. That and in, you know we could again talk for a whole other hour about the significance of of mirrors in this film, but I love the scene where. Uh, Jean is talking to Colonel Harrington and they're, they're addressing each other in the mirror first before they, they make eye contact. And it's just this, this really thoughtful moment where he expresses, you know, his, he, he's not too excited to give up his bait, as you put it, but he, he's also concerned about, you know, these, uh, these self-righteous rich folk, they're not going to really take too kindly to your type, are they? Like, it was a, a very thoughtful, sincere conversation that they have in this, you know, mirrored compartments of their room. Um, and I also love the, uh, the um, duality, I guess, between Colonel Harrington and Muggsy, because in his, in his own way, Muggsy kind of plays the role of that parental unit that's an obstacle for the couple to get together. I mean, both Colonel Harrington and Muggsy are kind of these obstacles, parental-like obstacles for the, the couple to overcome and get together. Uh, so I, I love the kind of weird um, duality between, between Muggsy uh, and Colonel Harrington. Um, then the, the costumes, um, the, the costumes are, so fabulous, <laughs> so fabulous, and so modern. They're, they're all done by Edith Head. Um, I, I, I don't know if Edith Head also did Henry Fonda's many, many suit jackets and tuxes. I, I don't know that, but um, Edith Head, I, I don't know if this is something that a costume designer typically does then or now, but she would read the script and develop a, a real sense of her costumes as it related to, to character and, and narrative. And the, um, the, the real treat, I'm sure for her, was to fashion uh, you know, a whole wardrobe for one identity and then another for another you know, different identity. And they, they work so well. They just work so well. The, um, the, the con woman wardrobe is, is much kind of sharper. And um, I think someone in the chat referred to some of her outfits on the, the boat as scaly, uh, maybe like a snake and um, you know, black and white. And, and then of course, you know, the, the furs and the sharp hat that Andrew mentioned earlier that she's wearing on the boat as they dock in New York, uh, you know, her armor um, in that moment. They're just so thoughtful. And of course, the, the entrance of the Lady Eve Sidwich in this you know, beautiful white gown that's unlike anything that we've seen Jean wear or would see Jean wear. Um, the, the costumes were extraordinary and so well considered for character development, plot development. And Edith had loved dressing Barbara Stanwyck. Um, she dressed Barbara Stanwyck in numerous other movies. Um, Barbara Stanwyck went to the Parisian fashion shows and said, oh, they dress me better in Hollywood. And she meant Edith Head. So Edith Head had a, a really good understanding of her body and how to dress her for 
beauty and glamour, but also for her character. So uh, those are some of my comments on costumes. And you had asked about um, that lovely line, <laughs> lovely line. Um, uh, what is it? A woman's business office is a moonlit deck or something like that. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very honest because I'm sure at that time, um, you know, women were trying to marry into security and, and wealth and, you know, relationships could be business transactions, especially for a con woman. Um, but there's, you know, a kernel of unfortunate truth in that line too, but it's also, you know, incredibly poetic and uh, sharp as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the practice that Edith had engaged in is, is today is standard anyway. I don't know about in that era, but um, ideally a film that's firing on all cylinders, every opportunity to give us a sense of story and or character is going to be used and costume is a great way to do that. And if you hear actors talk, they talk about sometimes the tremendous importance of their costume in a given a given role or or even a given scene. And I, I find the contrast between her costumes and the, as the two characters that Lisa outlined um, you know, to be to be very thoughtful. Um, I I think that you know, her her dress when she first meets um, Henry Fonda has a sort of cutout in it, and um, I, I don't know if if I'm right about this, but it's sort of like you know, I've heard that type of design in an article of clothing referred to as a peekaboo, and it's almost sort of like it's it's kind of like a, a misdirection or a distraction. Um, because, you know, look here, but I'm gonna, you know, pick your pocket there, which is the sort of, you know, she's trying to sort of trap and trick him initially when she's in that costume. And, and I think it's appropriate there. She's not trying to, she's not trying to do the same sort of, you know, same sort of tricking or trapping when she's the Lady Eve. She knows that all she needs to do is sort of present herself as this, you know, as this figure and if she is basically, you know, bright and showy and British, that's going to be enough to get everyone, it seems, in that family to fall into line. And so that's why the costumes are so different. So I, I think there was a lot of thought related to what the character's doing in the respective uh, portions of the film. Absolutely. Let's see. Um, Kathleen, you have a question or comment. Hi, um, I really love the film and I laughed so much. Thank you for choosing it. Um, I just wanted to say quickly about the uh, cartoon introduction. I thought that was so, so clever and really set up the uh, what was gonna happen in the screwball comedy that was coming up. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, you're right. You know, he actually, that's something that Sturgis, he does at least does it in the Palm Beach story. I mean, they, communication experts will tell you whether it's storytelling or a business presentation or whatever, they will say, tell people what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you just told them. Right. And, um, it's really, it's very smart storytelling. It helps with efficiency down the line. Um, and, uh, in terms of not having to explain every little thing, I mean, we get a lot of a sense of the setup and the sort of turnabout and back and forth that's going to happen from that opening. And it's so rare during that period, I feel, to have Hollywood films give you, to use the opening credits as anything other than perhaps to tell you the setting of the story, but they usually didn't use it in that, you know, sort of thoughtfully of a, a, a th thoughtful communicative way. Um, Sturgis does it in at least two of his movies though. So, um, he was clearly, you know, happy to, to, to utilize it that way. Uh, Lisa. You covered it. I think the Looney Tunes group, the Looney Tunes uh, creators did it. it. It's, it's everything that you said, Andrew, it, it sets you up perfectly for what's to come. Uh, let's see. Um, Meg, you have a question or comment? Nope. Meg just went away. Okay. Oh, are you there, Meg? Meg, are you there? Okay. Uh, Dana, did you have another question or comment? I do. This is quick. Um, and it sort of just occurred to me this time around. I, I didn't really feel this way when I saw the movie before. I want to say something at the end and see what you think. Um, I, I, I sort of felt 
when when Henry Fonda walked in, onto into the ship and and saw Barbara Stanwyck and her father together, it it sort of immediately switched from being a, a screwball comedy to a, a very romantic comedy. We've been talking about this film like a screwball comedy, but I mean, I almost I almost felt like crying because I sort of felt as ridiculous as that sounds. I almost felt like they both went through a lot, and I I felt like. Henry Fonda kind of got a little bit of what he deserved, which is not what I would have expected to feel. And and finally, when I when we got to the end of the movie, they did deserve each other and they really were in love. And it, it just sort of, it's kind of the setup that we we want in romantic comedies. And, and, and he just, Sturgis just really achieved it beautifully to me at the very end of this movie. It sort of came as a shock that they, I felt like, oh, these two people really do belong together. Isn't that sweet? And and it, I just was curious what you thought. I, I mean, in, in a sense, every screwball comedy, the reason they're called, part of the reason they're called screwball comedies is because the man and the woman put each other through their paces. And, you know, typically it, the stakes in there, I shouldn't say the stakes, but typically the tone and the motivation and the emotional baggage of their doing that isn't nearly so heavy um, or established or meaningful. And I think that might be part of the reason why you, you know, you felt a little bit, you know, I don't want to say sad, but you felt sort of emotionally tired by the end and you were so relieved that they got together. That's what, that's what all of these movies do. The difference I think in this one is that, you know, as we've been talking about for the last hour, the sort of motivations behind their their back and forth and the um, the nature of their characters engaging in the back and forth and the way they ex- put themselves out there those sorts of you know personal emotional dramatic stakes are much higher in this movie than they, than they tend to be in a lot of these others heck in a lot of these others these are the question is are people you know people a lot of these other movies people have been together for a while and then they break up and have to decide whether they're going to get back together or not so they sort of they have an investment in each other already here these characters are really putting themselves out there for something un- someone unknown and untested and that makes the the risks that much more sort of you know personally um s- stronger or bigger i think uh, lisa yeah, I'll add to to that final comment of yours, Andrew, and just to to agree with with you, Donna. I, I find the ending so emotional and sweet, and and especially because of of what um, what Henry Fonda's character says at the the very end. You know, after they've rushed down five flights of stairs to get to their state room so they can finally do it, I guess. Uh, but he, um, you know, she, she says, um, she, I, I don't remember the exact lines, but she, she wants to convey to him that, you know, she, she has something to tell him and, and he, he says, keep it to yourself. I don't, I don't need to know. We'll figure it out. Um, Cause he, you know, poor sweet man does not realize that, uh, Jean equals Eve yet. Um, and that statement, it has, it's really come full circle from where um, Charles was at the very beginning of the film where, you know, he's in the pursuit of knowledge and natural knowledge. Um, and, and here at the very end, he is, he is explicitly saying, I don't need to know whatever, you know, tacitly whatever bad thing you want to tell me we'll figure it out and you know eventually clearly there's going to have to be some conversation but he he is not entering into this in ignorance anymore he is entering into this relationship not knowing out of trust and and that is just such a a, a very emotional change you know, both of these characters go through pretty substantial and pretty sincere emotional progression through the film and so yes I agree it's a very moving ending and you know they're, they're already married but that was just kind of a you know piece of paper before they're, they're endorsing and, and kind of reestablishing their relationship on equal terms at the end. See that's interesting because I thought there was a little bit 
I mean, one, he, you know, he got more information than he wanted the first time he met Gene and he wasn't going to make that mistake again. But I also think he was clearly all gussied up for his wedding night on the train with Eve. And then she started talking about her history and that got killed. So I think at the very least, he was not going to let that happen again, but perhaps he was not going to let both of those things happen again. Um, you know, if we want to give him sort of full credit for being a well-rounded uh, person, I'm not, I'm not sure, but that could just be my cynicism. Um, let's see, uh, Kenneth, did you have another question or comment? Uh, just one quick thing. Um, if anybody noticed when I was looking for uh, YouTube clips about the movie, I came across an interview with Peter Bogdanovich. Uh, it was about a 12 minute interview just about this movie. And, uh, and he really raved about it. He said that this movie couldn't have been any better than it was. He thought it was excellent. And he made a point that they usually would call this movie a farce, but if you call it a farce, people won't watch it. If you call it a screwball comedy, that brings people in to watch. So he, uh, that was his interpretation. And I, I thought it was uh, for him to have spent that much time talking about a movie he wasn't involved in. Uh, I, I was pretty impressed. Well, Peter Bogdanovich made a, a second and much longer career talking about movies he wasn't involved in, um, as opposed to, I mean, he's, he's, he's had more books and more television shows and, you know, more, you know, podcasts and whatever talking about other people's movies than he spent time making feature films himself. I'm by this point, I'm quite certain that being said, um, part of the reason that that's true is he has a tremendous amount of insight, particularly about classical Hollywood. And um, Preston Sturgis's movies are always, are, are the ones that, you know, some people find them too farcical. Some people find the use of the animals or the sped up running down the stairs or whatever it is as a bit too much silliness that belongs more in a Marx Brothers movie than in a, you know, a so-called romantic comedy. Um, but I think he's, I think one of his great skills is balancing all of that. And I think he does. And um, the other thing I would say is I, I really am gratified that so many people found this movie to be so funny watching it, you know, by themselves or with only a couple of other people in their houses, because comedies play much, much better, particularly yeah. if you've never seen them before in a theater and, or at least with a large group of people. And that. Um, th that Sturgis is able to make so many of us laugh so much when we're sort of seeing these things solo or only with a couple of people is, is a testament to, to his skill, I think. Uh, Lisa, did you have any thoughts on that last comment? Uh, Peter Bogdanovich loves screwball comedies so much that he essentially made a couple of his own. Uh, I highly recommend that everyone go watch What's Up Doc, one of uh, Peter Bogdanovich's, right. one of the all time funniest films of all time. Like it, it's that good, I'm gonna say all time twice. So he, he particularly loved the screwball comedy genre and, and was inspired by Preston Sturgis to, uh, you know, in, in some of his own films. In fact, uh, famously, he, um, Barbara Streisand is the, the female lead of What's Up Doc and he screened the Lady Eve for her in one other screwball comedy, which I'm, maybe it was bringing up baby. And, uh, she hated it. <laughs> so um, it, it doesn't work for everyone apparently. Uh, but yes, uh, Peter Bogdanovich is a, a, a big fan um, of Screwball and of Preston Sturgis. Well, I feel better knowing that because if I lived in a world where Barbara Streisand and I both thought the same things were funny, I, I don't know what I would do with myself. <laughs> uh, Steve, did you have a final question or comment? Yeah, just a couple of things. I'm very fortunate. My wife works at Lettington Library, so we've been sort of beating the system on some of the films that we've seen over the last uh, three or four months, we're able to take the DVD out of the library, and uh, so we saved three ninety-five many times. But more importantly, on this particular one, I was so intrigued by Lisa's introduction that in watching this DVD, they also had a special, uh, special, commentary? special commentary. So we actually, first of all, Peter Bogdanovich was actually on this, and he did his ten or fifteen-minute interview or his presentation on this DVD. So we did hear that. And you're right about a forest versus um, versus a screwball comedy, but 
It was, but we, we actually enjoyed it so much. We watched it again with a running commentary that was done in 2001, which explained a lot of the things that were, that were happening during the movie. And it really kind of brought it even more to life. But there are two comments I'd like to make, two quick, quick comments about the horse. The comment that was made in 2001 by the individual that had a running commentary through the whole movie was that Barbara Stanwyck really had trouble keeping a straight face. Although he, he felt that, that, Peter, that Henry Fonda managed to keep a straight face. But if you look very carefully, she's, she's holding back from breaking out. So that was one of the observations. And, and I thought Barbara Stanwyck was actually <clears throat> mesmerizing for the whole movie. And I had never perceived or seen her in anything like that. And it was really fascinating to see the way she jumped out on the screen. The other thing was that Henry Fonda never did a movie like that again. That was his first screwball and his last screwball comedy. And he never did. He did it once. And I think that was the last time he actually ever got involved in anything like that. And my final thought was that here he was on the train with Eve. And he was pretty much upset with all her past uh, history with other men. But yet, and Lisa sort of took the steam away from me at the end. I was going to say this earlier on, but I really hesitated to get into it. Unfortunately, Lisa brought it up. But here he was at the end, and you knew her history. And even in the beginning, she talked about all the men she was with and all the things she had to do to, to get money out of them. And yet he sort of bypassed that at the end because you could look at it, as Lisa said, he, he looked at it in a way that, okay, I look at it differently now. I'm willing to accept her now, but I wasn't willing to accept it before. And the question is, did he really eventually know who she was? But I, I thought it was fascinating to watch, and especially on a rewatch, which I had not done before on some of these movies, even though we've had the DVD. On the rewatch, listening to the commentary, and if anybody wants to do that, it's worth the, it's worth the effort. It was fascinating with the in, it, nuances Thank and innuendos. Through the Thank whole you. Movie. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Steve. Thanks for that recommendation. Yeah. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us uh, for uh, a very lively discussion um, about a very lively movie. Um, and uh, Lisa, thank you for suggesting it and bringing it uh, you know, to the fore here. Um, we have some seminars coming up on Tuesday nights. Tomorrow night, we have a few spots left in Paul Wright's seminar on Apocalypse Now. And then uh, two weeks after that, Jennifer Flieger will be introducing us to Ingmar Bergman. And there will be more seminars uh, for September and October announced soon. Uh, in the meantime, you can find out more about those on our website. And you can find out about everything else we're doing in uh, Theater 5, where our new films are available for uh, streaming, and Film Studies Online, where all of our education stuff mm -hmm. is. And if you would like to know uh, what we are doing and what each week's movie is, we announce the new movie and have a link to the introduction every Thursday night uh, before our discussion on Monday nights, um, please sign up for our emails, and that'll let you know every week what's coming up uh, and what's new uh, around Bryn Mawr Film Institute. And um, until we can be back in the theater together uh, again, safely and enjoyably, um, we appreciate your joining us online and ask you if you have the means and are so inclined, please consider um, showing us some support via a donation. We would greatly appreciate it. But until next week, uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you for our next discussion. Take care.